flicker in. Do you know, it works. So I wanted to make this video about a mid-engine interpretation of the Toyota GT86. I started making my first doodles and went to grab some tea. As I came back, I discovered this. The youngest member of our family had chewed on the tip of my apple pencil, putting me out of business for four days. And instead of waiting for the delivery of the new tips, I decided to change the way I'll proceed with this video, answering the question, is it possible to create a car render of acceptable quality, when the only tools you are left with are a keyboard and a mouse? I'll make two renders, each taking around 5 minutes of this video. Afterwards, you'll see a short tutorial where I will explain all the tools I've used. So, who could this be useful for? I see at least two scenarios. Scenario number one is hardware or software failure. I can't say I've seen many broken tablets or styluses, but there's always a possibility that something can just break. Software-wise, we're all familiar with the situation when a hardware manufacturer wants us to update our drivers, claiming they've improved stability and stuff. We download and install it, only to see how the whole system fails in the most epic way possible, at the most inappropriate moment possible. So it's good to be prepared for moments like this. Scenario number two is exploring Photoshop before you can get your hands on your first tablet. Unfortunately, there are so many young people out there, especially in developing countries with a passion for cars and design, who have a computer in their households as a necessity, but have no other choice than to make their sketches on paper because the pen tablet remains a luxury item for them. They want to try digital design, but how and where to start? I know that very well. Between the moment my parents bought me my first computer and the moment I could afford a pen tablet, years passed. I was trying to do my designs in Photoshop with the keyboard and the mouse alongside my analog sketches. That helped me get familiar with Photoshop and ultimately be better prepared for design school. Today, having the ability to work with the best hardware the market of digital painting has to offer, I'm not having as much fun with this keyboard and mouse combination anymore, obviously. But back then, having nothing to compare my experience with, I felt more than happy to be able to take my first steps in Photoshop even without a pen tablet. I just hugely missed some kind of tutorials that could have helped me to save so much time. And if this video will somehow help even one single person, I will consider this worth the time I've spent making it. So I took a Toyota GT86 as my inspiration not in terms of design, but rather as what this car stands for. I will go deeper into this while making my next render. I also have taken an image of this car as an underlay to be close to the original wheelbase and height, yet I made it a little lower and gave it larger wheels to create a more expressive look. This is acceptable doing design renders like this one. It's not a technical drawing and I can exaggerate certain aspects of my design to get that more striking look, so to speak. It doesn't mean, though, I can go ridiculous with my proportions. Let me get a bit more concrete here. You see, making sketches or renders, we oftentimes exaggerate the overall proportions and certain details to put more character and life in the image we're creating. It's necessary to make our designs appear more pronounced and obvious. Why is that? Being designer means to be in a constant competition with others. You have to make sure your work stands out. So you start pumping your design up to make it more appealing, even if it contradicts the reality. But how far should we go? I'll make this analogy. So you see this image of Batman. It's very far from reality. It's not even a human being anymore at this point. It's a humanoid creature. But this is absolutely okay to have this kind of proportions within the genre of comic sketches. This sketch is not meant to leave the pages of a comic book, but a car render is. So it's rather a not so good idea to separate your car sketch from reality this far. On the other hand, we don't want to depict the reality as it is, since in most cases it doesn't look too exciting. It's boring to sketch, it's boring to present, it's boring to look at. So it makes sense to go for something in the middle, still exaggerated and powerful, yet can be related to the real world. My point here is, you can be highly expressive with your car sketches, but stay reasonable. 
Having said all this, there are no laws or rules here. I know designers who go into the extremes of exaggeration and are very successful doing so, but they know exactly what they do. And this example with Batman is a solid middle ground from which you can better decide where you want to go. But if you're doing a student project that's meant to be out of this world, or you design cars for toy companies or video games cars, then it's a completely different story again. Okay, back to our render. All the tools I'm using here are really basic. And as I said, I will explain all of them towards the end of this video. At this point, I have to talk about some advantages and disadvantages of working with a keyboard and a mouse only. The advantages, as I already mentioned, are that you can start exploring Photoshop and transition from analog to digital without any additional hardware. It's also a useful backup skill in case something goes wrong with your pen tablet, if you own one. The disadvantages are that in almost all situations, it's not the most time-effective way to create a car render. It's a very tedious and time-consuming process as well. Also, it can be very challenging to maintain artistic sensibility in your lines and shapes. It's not to say you can't deliver a nice image without a pen tablet, but it will require some adjustments to your workflow for sure. And I would say it makes fun only if you are a very patient type of a person, or you just like um, pain for some reason. Pain. This method is also not the best for the ideation phase of your work, since you can't be flexible and fast enough to go through different designs and variations. It would just take you an unreasonable amount of time. So a thoroughly done analog sketch is required, which you can then either photograph or scan to continue in Photoshop and start your rendering process. With my second render, I'll take a different route. I will morph an existing image into the design of the previous render using the same tools. It's a good exercise as well, since I'll have to follow more realistic proportions. I'd like to say a few words about the Toyota GT86 and my transformation of it. I am very much in love with this car, especially with the philosophy behind it. It's an affordable sports car with an arguably unbeatable fun per dollar ratio. It's light, it's nimble, it's powerful enough to make you smile, and its steering and suspension are refined enough so you can grow with it as a driving enthusiast. But it's not here to break any speed records or lap times. How many of us are chasing numbers really? Nor is it here to be your bedroom poster car. You don't have to save money forever to get one, and you don't have to be a world-class racing driver to enjoy it. It's interesting how such a product comes from the company that's not particularly known for being emotional. Yes, they've got Supra in their lineup as a Halo product. And the Yaris GR is like a video game psycho character, who reminds the world that Toyota can sometimes go nuts. With these two cars, Toyota is covering their marketing needs to attract younger population and maintain coolness factor. But still, this romantic notion of pure driving pleasure isn't something they can call to be their domain. Yet, they are one of the very few brands who produce an approachable, simple and honest sports car with traditional roots. With this in mind, I'm imagining what if Toyota gifted us with something that follows the same recipe, but with a mid-engine layout. I'm reflecting this in my render as well, taking the GT86 not as a design reference, but as a representation of what this car stands for. I want to maintain this balance of something athletic and focused looking, without intimidating the customer too much, without making the impression of being too demanding to its future owner. The design message should be something like, hey, we can have lots of fun together, but don't worry, I won't bite your head off should you accidentally go too far. Like the front end, for instance. I have this aggressive looking headlights and bumper area, and some sharp edges here and there. However, no big holes, no skirts, no sticking aerodynamic elements and such. It's sporty, but not brutal. Body side, same thing. I have this very pronounced concave wave, so to speak, crossing diagonally the body side and meaty fenders, but again, no large air intakes, no sticking or floating elements, and a relatively modest rocker area, modest for a design render anyways. I don't want this car to appear as something it's not. Men's physique category athlete, yes. Open division pro bodybuilder, no. As a result, despite all this sportiness, this car can be your daily partner, giving you enough trunk space front and rear, being firm yet calm.
comfortable while driving it and not forcing you to fold your body beyond your natural abilities every time you want to get in and out. And that's the beauty of it. Now, I could have doubled down on precision and attention to small details, but it would have quadrupled the amount of time needed for that. As I've already said, this way of rendering can be very time-consuming, so some healthy compromises have to be made. And dare I say, I believe I've already made my point answering the question I've posed in the beginning of this video. These are my results. Ok, now let's go to the tutorial I've promised. I deliberately have only used 7 very simple tools that you can understand and start applying literally in the first 10 minutes after you've opened Photoshop for the first time. First I use the pen tool to create a shape. Then I press down the command key or control key if you are a Windows user and I click on that shape layer on the right to transform it into selection. Then I pick the brush tool and fill my selection with color when needed. What I do next is I go to the Select menu on the top and click on Transform Selection. I move the selection with the arrow keys a couple of steps down and then I erase everything within the selection with the eraser tool. And like this, I have my first line. I also erase a bit from both ends of the line to make it look like a brush stroke. So here again, create a shape with the pen tool, convert it into a selection, fill it with color using the brush tool, shift the selection and erase what's inside with the eraser tool. Thin both ends and you're done. Repeat all the steps again for the next line. I'm clicking every tool with my mouse here, so you can see exactly what I'm doing. But this isn't the healthy way to do your work. Once you've covered the basics, don't forget to start using shortcuts. They help streamlining your work process immensely. Ok, this is how I create my lines. The second tool I'm using is Gaussian Blur, to make my lines and sharp edges of my shaders softer, just a little bit. This step might seem unnecessary but in the end it makes a big difference giving the image more natural look. Next, shaders. I use kind of three types of shaders. The first one is where I just create a color spot with the brush tool and then transform it to make it cover most of the car body. For that I go to edit menu. You don't see it because my recording window is cut off, but believe me, it's there. I then click on transform and finally I choose Scale to give my color spot the shape I need. Very simple. The second shader type I start again with a simple soft color spot. I then go to Transform again, but this time I choose the Warp tool. It's much more flexible than the Scale tool and I can warp my shader to give it a more complex shape. So it was the rear fender and I do the same with the front fender. Using the pen tool again, I go around the silhouette of my car to make a selection from it, to finally erase the parts of the shaders I don't need. As you can see the pen tool is absolutely essential here, since the mouse is a precise pointing tool, but it's a very bad drawing tool. And the third shader type is where I write from the beginning, isolating a certain area with the pen tool, converting it into a selection, and then with a soft brush I partially apply color within the selected area. 
If I'm not happy with it, I don't have to redo all the steps again. Instead, I make corrections with the warp tool you're already familiar with. So, a couple more examples. Pen tool, selection, brush tool. Pen tool, selection, then brush tool. And when I need to soften my shade non-uniformly, I use the motion blur tool. It's kind of the same as Gaussian blur, but as the name motion blur suggests, I can adjust the direction of the blur. One more time. Pen tool, selection, brush tool, warping. And finally, the smudge tool. It's useful when, for instance, all my layers are merged into one, but I still want to make some corrections. And sometimes it's just easier to smudge certain areas than repainting them. It's especially true when doing some fast photo editings, like with my second render. And that's all there is to it, really. Just 7 tools. I follow these simple steps and just repeat them again and again till I get my desired result. Can it get any simpler than that? So now, with this little knowledge, you can rewatch this video again with fresh eyes and clear understanding of how I went from A to B. And it will for sure help you make your first steps in Photoshop rendering cards, even if you currently don't own a pen tablet or a pen display. That's it for today. Hope I could share some useful information with you. Have a great time.